are so in a mode of celebration of his life and his work and his ethos of love and sharing and communalism. So welcome to all of you. So I'm gonna start us off and the first, and I'm gonna try to keep myself together as I'm up here. And the first thing I would like to do is um, invite in the spirit and the spirits, and particularly the spirit of Dennis Cunningham, of my father, of our father, and of his mother and father, and of his brother, and his sister, and his brother is, who is here right now. And we would just like to invite all of the spirits in right now. And if you would just take a moment of silence with me to welcome them and welcome him to bless this gathering right here, right now. So there are many people here who are going to say words and many will speak to my father's life as a lawyer and as an activist and uh, as a bringer of unity and as a bringer of righteousness against the powers that be because that was in his nature was to resist oppression and resist racism and to resist all the things that make life bad for people on this planet. He was a great environmentalist. He supported anything and everything that made sense to him and which was life affirming. So all I'm going to speak to very briefly is to his role as my father. And he uh, was a very complex father, <laughs> if I may say. He um, modeled for me how to allow yourself to change, how to become something more and something different than what you were. He struggled with himself as he struggled in the struggle. And what I learned from him was how to look at myself with love and with open eyes and to understand I can change and I will change and I have changed as he did in his life. He changed so much and he became this wise man to whom I could look to and speak with and receive some understanding, some way forward, even if at times it was uh, mysterious and not clear. <laughs> Sometimes I'd walk into the room, I'd say, hey, Dad, what's up? <laughs> everything is everything. <laughs> and sometimes I'd walk in the room and I'd say, Dad, what's up? He'd say, ain't nothing. <laughs> he ran the gamut. And he, the gamut, kid, the whole range of things. In any case, I am just so grateful to you all for being here. And I am going to call up our next speaker. Don't you let them stop you. Oh, distract you from what's right. Always keep in mind the trees, let them be your guiding light. Where you going today, my friend? Or didn't you hear the news about Judy and Daryl? Applying to bomb and the FBI's abuse about locking up the victims while assassins are running free about free to say what's on your mind till you mess with the big money. Friends, the trees are calling, thousands falling every day and night. <coughs> Don't you let them stop you or distract you from what's right. Always 
Keep in mind the trees, let them be your guiding love. Where are you going today, my friend? Well, I thought I would head south. I gotta tell the people of this land, this just ain't working out. Are they trying to stop the people's voice? A common government spore. But it seems they still don't know us yet. They've only <laughs> helped to call us for. Friends, the trees are calling, thousands falling every day and night. We won't let them stop us. Or distract us from what's right. Redwood summer's just begun. We're not giving in to fry. Redwood summer's just begun. The good fortune to start my lawyering, lawyering life at the People's Law Office in the fall of 1970. In its short existence, the office was already deeply involved in a number of important political cases, including the efforts to expose the assassination of Fred Hampton, the representation of the surviving Panthers of the deadly raid, as well as the young lords and the weathermen. Dennis was five to ten years older than the rest of us and was our most experienced lawyer, having practiced out of his house, representing political and community activists, including Fred Hampton before his murder. I had never met anyone like Dennis. The way he talked, the way he carried himself, and how he approached the legal work. In many ways, he embodied the revolutionary spirit of the times and was a great influence on all of us. Dennis was always thinking and plotting how to use our legal skills and cases to advance the movements for justice and liberation. About a year after I arrived, after much discussion in which Dennis played a pivotal role, the office made a commitment to send people to Attica Prison in upstate New York following the killings and torture of protesting prisoners. While Flint and Jeff went to help it was Dennis and I who wound up spending months and years living in Buffalo, New York, helping to organize the Attica Brothers' legal offense defense on behalf of the brothers who were murdered, shot, and tortured, and the 42 brothers facing hundreds of felony charges. Attica is where I learned how to be a people's lawyer, D.C. style. <laughs> Dennis was fearless. He never played down the state murders, the responsibility of Governor Rockefeller for ordering the deadly assault, or the reality of prisons, racism, or the ongoing cover-up of the Attica prosecutions. He was a master strategist and a brilliant writer. He had a direct way of speaking the political truth in court, and his written submissions were filled with strong and colorful language. <laughs> I learned the importance of presenting the politics of your case in creative and forceful ways. Politics in command was one of his favorite phrases. I also saw how he related to the Attica brothers, how he showed them real respect and how he understood the importance of following their leadership. We spent many hours meeting with the brothers and we were both deeply impressed by their political clarity, resilience, and commitment to fight back. We both learned a lot fighting for justice for the Attica brothers and we developed a lifelong bond with each other and with many of the brothers. Dennis never hit his politics. I remember once we were back in Chicago in the Cook County criminal courts before a tough Chicago type judge who knew Dennis was involved at Attica, and he asked, what was Attica about? Dennis responded with one word, genocide. We continued to work together on many political cases over the next years, the Attica class action civil suit, challenging Marion prison control units, defending the brothers' charge in the Pontiac prison rebellion, and the defense of the Puerto Rican independentistas. Our work continued even after he permanently relocated to California. He was always willing to be there when asked, which I, temp I frequently did. 
in Solo is Zania's Hill in Indiana death penalty case in defense of Palestinian community leaders Rasmia O'Day and Mohammed Salah. I also came to California to help in the early stages of the Judy Berry case. Dennis was great fun to be around. I owe my love of jazz to him and the nights we spent at the Jazz Showcase in Chicago. I owe much to this unique and extraordinary man, not least of which was getting to know his four children and watch them become amazing adults. Dennis was my closest friend, my political and personal confidant, and I think about him all the time and miss him terribly. But his spirit is with me every time I step in the courtroom, file a brief, or make a speech, asking myself, what would Dennis say? So when I was getting ready to speak um, today, thinking about Dennis and what he, who he was and what he loved, a string of words came into my head. Jazz, beer, basketball, weed, dogs, his kids, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> his grandkids, family and friends, clients who became family and friends. Um, he was a many faceted man. Smooth, steady, and solid was how I saw him. You could rely on him, you could count on him. Sorry. He was committed to his political principles, as others have said, just and righteous. He was among the first to steadfastly, as Michael said, and unequivocally incorporate the real story, the people's story, into the legal documents that he wrote, and in that way, and filed and argued, and in that way he wrote and recorded history and shaped the narrative. He was the first person I knew who wrote all power to the people at the end of a brief. <laughs> and never lost the ability to love, the love of play, especially with children and dogs. And the love of a good party. I can still see that indescribable Dennis dance, mostly with arms. <laughs> After he moved to San Francisco, every year he would come to the Chicago Jazz Festival on his way to or from Iron River, which he loved, being with all of you. And um, he would stay with Michael and Erica or Flint and me. And we had what became the annual Dennis Cunningham Labor Day barbecue in the backyard. And he might get dressed up. He'd put on his red chili pepper shirt <laughs> or his brown tweed jacket. Um, and everyone would come to see him and hang out with him and catch up and share the love. So here's a poem, if I can get through it, for all of us to take with us by John O'Donohue, an Irish poet and priest, a blessing called The Noct. And a kurah, if I say that correctly, is a canvas boat. That's, I'm just telling you that before the poem. That's not part of it. <laughs> on the day when the weight be deadened on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo red, green, and azure blue, come to waken in you a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays in the Quran of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And may, so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. Send their warm remembrances, their remembrances as to Dennis being friend, mentor, and comrade. That includes Don Stang, Susie Weisdorf, Mara Siegel, Holly Hill, Jan Sussler, 
Chick Hoffman, Peter Schmiedel. I know I'm forgetting some people, but those are some of the people who sent wonderful remembrances. And of course, we've lost a few of others, and some are here today. Personally, there are over 54 years that I knew Dennis and worked with Dennis and loved Dennis and listened to Dennis, sometimes into the wee wee hours of the morning, <laughs> where you'd be nodding out and Dennis would be taking another hit and laying it out. <laughs> So you finally had to say, Dennis, I got to get up tomorrow. <laughs> There's too many of those memories to recount, of course. But one, and I hesitate to correct my noble and wonderful wife a tiny bit. But the story behind the all power to the people in the brief is this. One of those early mornings where we were putting the final touches on the Fred Hampton brief in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, a 250-page masterpiece that we worked on for days and weeks and months and years. Jeff and I and Dennis were deciding how to cap it off. And we all agreed quite un- uh, lawyer-like, to put a picture of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark on the inside cover of the brief. But then when Dennis said, we're signing this, all power to the people, we didn't quite all agree that we should do that. <laughs> so we reached a compromise that Dennis is still complaining about from wherever he is now. <laughs> We signed it, respectfully submitted, but put all power to the people on the left-hand side. <laughs> so, that is just one example of Dennis's unwavering commitment to his principles, uncompromising. That's what, as you all said and Michael talked about, what he taught us. He ta and he taught us how to write. He taught us how to fight. He gave us several gifts, and I'll mention only a few. His gifts and his legacy include, of course, his family. He gave us his family, starting with his mother, Deborah, his father, father Bobby, of course, the Fab Four <laughs> and their families, Rob and his family, including Molly, who is in Chicago, working at the University of Chicago, and all the wonderful children. He gave us Fred Hampton. He gave us Fred Hampton in life, he gave us Fred Hampton in death, and he gave us so many other wonderful clients, organizations, and people who gave us and continue to give us such strength to continue the fight. And finally, he gave us the People's Law Office. And damn People's Law Office is 54 years old, and still going th strong. Thank you. Uh, you have to control your client. That's not happening with the Attica brothers. Um, and that, and the, it was clear in the way that Dennis and the legal team operated and the way that he led the legal work was that the le role of the legal person was to support the activists, to support the struggle, to learn and give voice to their experience and their wisdom and to trust that. And uh, that was really uh, an invaluable <laughs> piece of learning for me, uh, but also it was part, a uh, key element of what made uh, the defense successful on a lot of levels. Um, during the trials, I lived in a collective defense house, Dennis and Michael, Liz Fink, and eventually uh, Rob. 
who Dennis recruited to come and help with the grassroots organizing during the trials. Uh, and so I was there in the summers when the kids came and that was a, a highlight of the year. It was a very stressful situation and it was wonderful to have those kids to, to play with and, and hang out with and de-stress with, and play lots of games of cards and things like that. And one of the things for me uh, becoming uh, their aunt and mom, basically, mm -hmm. I've been able to know them through the years and as adults and they really uh, need to be included on Dennis's list of accomplishments. Um, and then the last thing I, I told them is I'll always be grateful to him for recruiting Rob to come to Buffalo. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, after the trials ended and, and the defense people dispersed, several of us ended up in Appalachia and Kentucky working with grassroots organizations and that included Rob and I. And then in 1980, Kevin was born and the family started. And through the years, uh, I continued, got to continue to notice or know and see Dennis at family events in Iron River, uh, playing games of dictionary and other things, hanging out at Christmas celebrations, decorating cookies, and just, uh, as you know, he's, it could be the life of the party. And it was always wonderful to have him around. It's still weird that he's not. Um, but we have him in our memories and in the way he influenced our action and, and that's a great legacy for him. So thank you. It's really an honor to be here today and to be able to talk about and have known Dennis. Uh, there was a commonality to the speeches before me and I just wondered so many people, how many people here were organized or influenced by Dennis Cunningham to do what they do today. Maybe you can raise our hands, but how many people here's lives were changed by Dennis Cunningham? It's out there, man. I think he was <laughs> and is an inspiration to, to so many of us. Uh, for 40 years, I've been coming, when I came to California, uh, the cherry on top was always spending time with Dennis after things, during things, but going and hanging out with him at Mission Street, talking about what was going on. And it's very strange to come out here again and not have Dennis to greet me. And yet I'm here and we're all here because of Dennis. And I think Dennis is very pre present today as we recognize in the memories and all of that he's, and all the people that he's influenced. It's an honor to have known and to reminisce with all of you, or you all, as I still am accustomed to say, about my good friend, comrade, and law partner, Dennis Cunningham. It's hard to talk about Dennis in the past because his personality and legacies are so much with us. With us as an example of a principled, iconoclastic life that challenged everything through the lens of justice and anti-racism with us in the visions, wisdom, and the creativity that he imparted through his movement, gestures, and histrionic style. With us, with us in the memories of the parent school and co-parenting with Mona to foster the creativity, the uniqueness, the special talents, and gifts to society of all of their, as we still call them, kids. We remember Dennis because when Fred was murdered and Dennis actually was had appendicitis and couldn't go out, uh, and we went out and had to go to court to represent the survivors and we interviewed the survivors. Uh, I interviewed Deborah and Flint went to the apartment to see the, the chaos or the mayhem after the police. But Dennis was always pushing us to to bring forth to show what happened, to bring the shooters to justice, to bring Hanrahan to justice, eventually to bring the FBI, to expose them all, not to compromise. And he was always a tremendous force, ending up, of course, with, as been pointed out, the all power of the people on the brief that we finally wrote. Uh, and there's another memory that we got to replay with Dennis a little bit because as has been mentioned, 
he spoke truth to power rather bluntly sometime. <laughs> and we're doing a podcast, and so we remembered the moment when we were in front of the Court of Appeals. And we had done our, Flynn and I had talked, and the other side had, and the reactionary justice, our claim was that the fascist murder of Fred Hampton had been condoned and protected by all of the systems in Chicago, the Daily Machine, the police supposed investigation body, and by the courts, and that they were all part of this fascist scheme. And so when rebuttal time came, the justice asked Dennis, who was the, gonna respond, are we part of the fascist, fascist conspiracy too, if we affirm the conviction? And I think we were all sitting there, well, what is gonna happen now? <laughs> Flynn actually found the trans. Well, for a moment, actually, De Dennis was diplomatic. He, did, he, resent he still resented it in his last days that he said, yes, you are. But he didn't say that. He wound about a little bit and sort of said, well, if the shoe fits, where? <laughs> moment. Anyway, uh, I met Dennis on April 4th of 1968, and it was the night that Dr. King was murdered, and there was rebellion in the streets of Chicago, and they were picking up kids uh, off the streets for being out there, and everybody was on the, on the news, and they were telling white people to hunker down and stay away from all these neighborhoods, and Something about it, uh, I, I wasn't happy with it. And so I went down to the 11th and State, the police station, and there I met Dennis Cunningham, and we were defending the young people that were picked up that night who were, they were trying to hold just for being out on the street. And it was strange. I saw this odd Ichabod Crane looking guy in a, cor <laughs> in a, in a corduroy coat with, uh, you know, with uh, elbow, uh, <laughs> another elbow. Uh, on, on his jacket. But we, anyway, we did it that night. And a year later, when he started the People's Law Office, he remembered me and I had the privilege of, of joining and becoming a partner with Dennis. And by that time, Dennis had met Fred, Fred Hampton, and Fred said, we need a People's Law Office. We're getting busted every time we sell a newspaper, every time we have a demonstration. And so Fred, uh, Dennis took that to heart. And so he asked several of us to come and start the People's Law Office in the inauspicious, inauspicious shop on Halstead Street with a banner, Fless's Homemade Sausage was over our <laughs> office for the first years, years of our office. But that uncompromising spirit of Dennis's that pushed the Fred Hampton case when the Attica Rebellion happened and we're in Chicago and we're, what do we do? There are no lawyers in New York. Then I said, no, we gotta be there too. And so I went up there with MZZ from the office and that started a campaign of decades of being at Attica. And Dennis was there and Michael was there. And so many of the people here were moved by Attica. And I remember if people saw the Liz Fink film, they said, how, how did you happen to get involved in Attica? You were just out of law school. And she said, well, I went up there and I fell in love with Big Black and Dennis Cunningham. <laughs> and that's how I started at Attica. So I think his ability to organize, to move us, I think when he brought Judy Berry to the National Lawyers Guild, he was way ahead of us in understanding the importance of environmental issues, the fact that we're facing deadly climate change, and I think that affected me and everybody else. And it just showed how much Dennis has been out front uh, in so many things. So while he is, is not here, uh, we do remember him. I have these early memories of when we started the PL, People's Law Office. Dennis had been at Second City. He, was, he and Mona were proponents of Story Theater. And so at our office meetings in Lincoln Park early on, we played tag and we moved <laughs> and we practiced. And I remember 
Dennis and Skip were particularly competitive and actually climbed trees to avoid being tagged by each other in those early days. In any case, uh, I just want to say, uh, let me put my title. As I said, I knew Dennis best early on, and then when I moved away, I knew met, met him many times on coming out to California. In December of 2019, on the 50th anniversary of the murder of Fred, Dennis drove me to a reading about Fred Hampton at the Zen Book Fair, where we shared the podium with Emery Douglas, <laughs> illustrator for the original Panther paper. Thanks to the setup by our good friend, Claude Marks, I was honored that day. But the Dennis was the reason why I was there. He was the reason I got to know about Fred Hampton and I wrote the book. And knowing Dennis and that connection that he made has changed my life forever. A little over a year ago, my family visited Dennis when he was at Joe's house in hospice care. We sat outside under an awning in a rare LA rain for four hours to tell stories and bask in the appreciation we all had for Dennis and Delia, Miranda, Joe, and Redbird, and Franny. They were also all there. I would not trade that day and its effect on me and all my family for anything. Dennis, you are still here. We love you and we honor you. And we try to emulate you and carry on your visions for a better, more egalitarian and anti-racist society. Thank you. Thank you.